Hi guys, this is going to be a bit of an impromptu video. Um, I watched Kellyanne's video um, called Healing Your Connection to Body Image and Food yesterday and um, while I was kind of starting to write a comment I realised that I just had way too much, <laughs> way too much to say and I thought right okay I think I'd better make a video response on this um, because basically everything she was talking about was just really relevant to me and um, it's a subject that I have a fair amount to say about I think. Um, and it's also something that I touched on in January but I never got back to again and I did mean to. Um, I did mean to get back to talking about um, spirituality and health and eating and stuff like that. Um, I've written a little bit of it, I've little, oh, excuse me, I've written a little bit on the blog um, about the connection between spirituality and physical health um, so I'll link that below. I will also link Kellyanne's video and um, she mentioned a video by Charlie Says Go uh, which was about cleaning up her diet. Um, I had wat watched that and I had really enjoyed it as well so I'll link that down below as well and hopefully that'll be all the links for this video. I'm not sure. Um, so um, I've made a couple of notes on Kellyanne's video and um, I've got a couple of highlight highlighted areas that I might kind of talk about in detail because they're particularly relevant to me. Um, but I think I might just start with giving you a little bit of a rundown on my experience with food, with weight loss and body image and all that kind of thing. Um, because it has been quite an up and down kind of journey for me. I have changed um, my diet quite a lot in the past, let's say six months. Um, I have kind of gradually implemented quite a lot of different changes and it's it's definitely ongoing. Um, I, I still want to get kind of more towards uh, a more plant-based diet. Um, I haven't actually even managed to become vegetarian yet, but I will consider it at some point. Um, but um, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so basically, I was one of those people growing up and in my teenage years and in college who thought I ate healthily when I really, really didn't. And I think that's probably quite common. Um, I felt that because I ate a handful of portions of fruit and vegetables every day, and I really do mean a handful, like really not that many. Um, I suppose, no, I wouldn't have even been getting like five a day. Um, I would have possibly been getting three or four decent sized portions of fruit or veg a day. And I was just of the, of well, I, what I had been taught, um, which was pretty limited, uh, was that that was fine. Um, I ate some brown bread. I mostly didn't eat white bread. I ate some brown bread at least um, and stuff like that, you know? So I, I was kind of in that situation where I felt like I don't eat loads of crisps. I don't drink soft drinks. I don't eat tons of sweets and chocolate, although I, you know, I've always eaten quite a lot of chocolate. So um, my diet wasn't something that I thought needed any changing. I, it just it was fine. It did me fine. I was grand. And that lasted up until, I think it was my second year in university. It was the summer of my second year in university, actually. Um, basically, I found university to be very, very stressful. Uh, it was very hard work from the get-go. When I went in in first year, um, we were really loaded with, with coursework, particularly in music. Um, and it was just not the experience I had been expecting. I put myself under an awful lot of pressure that I didn't really need to put, need to put myself under and stuff like that. So um, in second year, I got together with my now boyfriend, then boyfriend. We broke up in the middle for a while. <laughs> um, so I was 19 and that summer we went to Tokyo uh, for two weeks, which was fantastic. But I contracted some form of stomach bug while there. It wasn't really that bad. Well, it was bad enough for a couple of days, cleared up after a few days. It wasn't anything super serious. And another guy who was over there had it as well. And it was just kind of, I put it down to that or I thought it might have been something that I picked up on the plane. It like, it really wasn't anything that bad. Um, it was a fairly bad stomach bug, but I wasn't vomiting or anything. So it wasn't something that overly concerned me or anything. And I didn't feel the need to go to the doctor or anything like that. So I came home and I was fine. Um, but then after I came home, it was just like my stomach never settled down. Like, you know, when you've had a stomach flu, it just kind of can take you a few weeks for your stomach to completely like get back to normal. It just never, never settled down. And like a few months later, I noticed that it still hadn't settled down. I was kind of going, this is not normal. Um, and around the same time, I was noticing that I had absolutely no energy whatsoever. I was freaking out about my third year in college because um, in my third year, I was finishing music as a subject and also, um, 
my English coursework was going toward, I think it was like 30% of my final grade in English as well. So I was essentially, I had an awful lot of work to be doing in third year and I was freaking out about that and trying to do as much reading for English as I possibly could during the summer to reduce my coursework load for English and stuff like that. So I was under quite a lot of stress. Um, I was exhausted because I had finished my exams and literally straight away the next morning got on a plane to Tokyo. So I was like really run down and I, I went to the doctor and I thought there was something wrong with me. It's like, I'm exhausted. I can't stop falling asleep in the afternoon. My stomach is in bits. Um, and basically there was nothing wrong with me. So I was diagnosed with IBS. Um, and I basically suffered with that on and off for, oh, how many years? Um, third year, fourth year, my gap year, and pretty much, yeah, so about four years before it started to, to kind of sort itself out a bit. And it's been really five years before I've actually managed to get a handle on it properly to the point where it doesn't disrupt my life at all, um, where I can be pretty sure, I don't have to think about it anymore. You know, I don't have to, I'm, every time I go out for dinner, I don't have to think, oh God, am I gonna be in pain afterwards or, or whatever. Um, I don't talk to too many people about my IBS because it's just an awkward subject. Like I am somebody who will talk about taboo subjects, but like honestly, IBS, it's not pretty. Um, if you don't know what it is, it's irritable bowel syndrome. You know, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's not pretty, it's not attractive, and it's just not something that I really enjoy talking to people about. Um, and there's also an extent to which it feels like um, you're kind of blaming yourself for it as well. I mean, when, when I said to my mother that I'd been diagnosed with IBS, she said, oh, but that's, you can't have IBS. You, you know, you've got a good diet. Um, but you know, that wasn't the case. Now I've I kind of since come to the conclusion that my IBS was mostly stress induced. Um, but at the same time, yeah, it's hard to say whether my diet has like improved my IBS or my lack of stress has improved my IBS. Um, I still suffer from it or I still suffer from pain um, when I am stressed. So um, yeah, um, so that pretty much, that takes you up to basically, up to fairly recently. Um, I tried going on the FODMAP exclusion diet at one point, which is a, um, a diet specifically um, for people with IBS, it, it uh, eliminates a certain type of carbohydrate. So it eliminates a lot of grains, a lot of fruits and a lot of vegetables um, from your diet, which I had absolutely no joy with at all because um, I think it was because it made me so stressed that it just made me worse. <laughs> Sorry about that. I had to wait for them to stop using whatever gardening loud implement it is that they're using next door. Um, anyway, I was saying that um, if you are considering trying out a new diet of any kind, actually for any reason, but particularly for something like IBS, um, take it slow. Um, eliminate or replace one thing at a time. Um, actually, I should say, don't just eliminate, replace. Um, you're gonna have a much harder time changing your diet and um, eliminating certain foods if you don't just eliminate them, but you actually replace them, actively replace them with something else. Like don't just say to yourself, I'm gonna stop eating bread. You need to decide what you're gonna have instead of having bread. So, you know, or replace pasta with quinoa or um, replace bread with a salad or, you know, have a really concrete idea in your head as to what you're actually gonna eat instead. Um, bear in mind things like um, that if you're cutting out um, wheat products or grains and stuff like that and um, that they fill you up more than vegetables so you're going to have to eat more and you're probably going to have to maybe make sure you've got enough protein in your meal so that you don't feel hungry because grains have protein in them as well um, and obviously the same if you're going vegetarian or anything like that you need to be really aware of protein um, because I have found that one of my greatest issues when I'm changing up my diet is um, ending up with not enough protein and just being hungry and lethargic and you know it's not it's not a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, um, eventually I just kind of gradually started to become better. I started to eat porridge in the morning for breakfast with fruit and that that really, really helped me. That seemed to really set me on the road to recovery with my IBS. But also I just became less stressed. Um, I had a gap year from university and over the course of that gap year and during my, the following year, my master's and the following year, um, I kind of managed to get a handle on my stress and anxiety and started to, um, started to recover essentially. Um, but I don't think I have felt completely recovered really until I started to make the changes that I've made in the past six months. And I'm gonna talk about that a bit now. Um, 
One of the things that did kind of stay with me, I mean, after that summer when I was exhausted all the time, um, I did kind of regain some energy. But after I finished university and I went through a breakup in my final year in university as well, which was really, really difficult for me um, and just took a lot out of me physically and emotionally as well. Um, I just, um, I was just in a bit of a state <laughs> after I finished university on, on many, many levels. Um, and basically I kind of felt like I never really got back to myself. I never really regained all of my energy. I seemed to constantly be coming down with colds, be constantly sick. I realized that I was completely unfit, that I didn't do any exercise and stuff like that. So in the past year, um, six months to a year, I've really been like to make, implementing a lot of changes and trying to, um, yeah, trying to learn more about health as well and eating and what is actually healthy to be eating and what isn't. Um, so yeah, I've cut out wheat. That's one of the main things I did. First of all, I started drinking green smoothies um, around Christmas time last year. Um, and that was absolutely revolutionary for me. Um, it was the first time that I really got into a habit of eating raw vegetables at all, um, with just with the raw kale or spinach that I put in the smoothies. And I just straight away started feeling um, an improved, well, it, it threw my stomach, you know, off a little bit, but any changes always do throw my, my digestion off a little bit. So um, it took, you know, a few weeks maybe to get used to it. But in terms of energy and health and stuff like that, it's been absolutely, it has absolutely revolutionized. It's completely revolutionized my whole life. Um, then I cut out wheat. So I had been kind of cutting down on wheat, but eventually I just decided, okay, this needs to go and I need to see if I, see if I feel better. And that may be more than anything. Um, was a huge thing for me. I've cut down on grains in general. I don't eat too many other grains at all and I've completely cut out wheat. Um, so yeah, that was a huge one for me and like that might or might not be something that you need to do but I think a lot of IBS sufferers have an issue with wheat um, and if you do have problems with feeling lethargic or feeling getting sick all the time, just try it. <clears throat> you know, go off wheat for a month and see how you feel. If you don't feel any different, then fine, you can reintroduce it. But I think <clears throat> maybe more than anything the great thing about going off wheat was that it encouraged me or discouraged me to eat um to eat um prepackaged food or um processed things and stuff like that because if you eliminate wheat the chances are there aren't going to be that many processed things that you can eat you're you're straight away cutting out a huge amount of things um that you know like even just things like bread like cakes like um crackers and all those little bit snacky things that you end up munching on through the day that you know you don't even really notice how many of them you're eating um so i think that might be one of the things that made a huge difference for me as well um, and since then i've basically been gradually um i haven't really been eating red meat I was kind of trying to cut out on meat entirely, but I just found that my energy levels just dropped completely. So I think I'm just gonna to have to go back to that in a while when I've sorted out everything else first. Um, but I've been starting to eat a lot more um, raw vegetables. I will have another, at least one other portion of raw vegetables every day as well as my green smoothie. Um, you know, usually my lunch will be primarily raw vegetables and then my dinner will be primarily vegetables. And quinoa, quinoa is my favorite thing in the world. It might or might not be the most ethical thing to be eating, um, but it's absolutely saved me. Like I do, it just, I eat it so often and it's just been wonderful for me. Um, because I, I'm, I don't know, the jury is out on rice for me. Um, so I'm sure I've bored you to tears now with all of that. And I have actually talked about some of that before, um, in my video on, um, health and, and that kind of stuff, um, which I will link below. Um, one of the consequences of changing up my diet and exercise and all of that kind of stuff has been that I've lost um, a lot of weight. I've lost um, six and a half kilos of stone in about six months. Um, and it's, while I've always said that losing weight wasn't my primary motivation for any of this, um, it definitely was something that I wanted to do. And I would definitely say that I mostly wanted to lose fat and gain muscle. And at the time, I didn't really necessarily want to be any smaller in dimension. Um, I just, like I say, wanted to, um, yeah, lose muscle, lose um, fat and gain muscle. And uh, so basically just get more toned. Um, as it happens, I have definitely lost, you know, dimension. I have grown smaller in dimension um, and it's not, for me, it's, I'm not feeling like it's a bad thing. Um, I've definitely gotten really used to the weight that I am now and feeling lighter. Um, I think I kind of associate feeling lighter with feeling more energetic. And I don't know whether or not that actually is the case if 
literally carrying around what less weight is making me feel more energetic or if just the two things are coming hand in hand. Um, but I, I don't know, I, I don't think I have too bad an issue with body image and that kind of thing, but I am really aware that it is a, a major thing in my head as it is with most women and most people. <laughs> it's kind of one of those sad but inevitable things. Um, I definitely have an idea in my head of how I would like to look and that kind of thing. Um, I'm definitely quite aware of it. Um, I'm lucky enough that I've never suffered from an eating disorder or anything like that. And I've never gained a huge amount of weight. Um, I fluctuated a fair bit. Like I fluctuated up to the top of my, well, Kellyanne mentioned the BMI, how terrible BMI is and I completely agree. But just for, for reference sake, I fluctuated up to the top of my healthy BMI range um, at my heaviest and now I'm kind of between my between the lowest and the middle so yeah about um about 10 kilos or so or a stone and a half would that be something like that um but it's never been I've never felt like my body is drastically different I think this is the first time in my life that I've ever really felt like wow my body is really really different now and um, because the changes have always been gradual and they haven't really been that huge. Um, I also find that I lose and gain weight very uniformly all over so I won't suddenly you know in the space of a couple of months suddenly have a huge ass or something. It doesn't really work that way for me it's just kind of uniform. Um, I'd say the only the main reason I feel like my body is different though now is because I am fitter. I am fit fairly fit for the first time in my life. Um, I'm much stronger and things like that and I'm noticing those changes that are happening in my body a lot more than say losing the weight, losing the fat. Um, because, because things start to, you know, when you're losing fat all the time, it's just like parts of you are shrinking and just doesn't look that different. But with gaining muscle, I'm starting to notice like my arms look different, my abdomen seems to have muscle going on there and stuff like that, which is exciting. Um, but I'm also trying not to get too hung up on that either. And um, I do try to kind of steer clear of getting too hung up on having a really specific body image in mind. Um, but I definitely fall into that trap. Um, quite a lot so yeah I, I don't know I'm not sure where I I'm not sure how I feel about that Um, Shannon Celia I, that's how I say it in my head but I'm not sure if that's actually what it is you know that when you've got a, a name that you say in your head and you're not sure if you're actually saying it right <laughs> anyway she made a video on this as well I'm gonna have to link that below Um, not about food but about weight loss and um, body image and stuff and she was basically kind of just saying look I, you know, I want to be, I want to be skinny, I want to be thin, I want to lose this weight and um, I don't want to be told that I have to love myself the way I am, I, this is just what I want to do. Um, and I think that's, I kind of feel the same way to an extent, like I, I feel like I'm entitled to want to be thin if I want to be thin. I, maybe it's not ideal that the culture that we're, well it, obviously it's not ideal, the culture that we're living in. Um, body image is hugely distorted by the media, there, it's just huge huge problems with it. Um, everything that Kellyanne said is just um, completely on the ball with that but um, I do think there's a lot to be said for um, having a healthy body and a lot of the time that will mean not carrying as much fat as you have been. If you become healthier, you are liable to not carry as much fat. Your body will just stop holding on to those stores. But um, yeah, as Kellyanne said, just don't get too caught up in having a very particular goal in mind because your optimum body weight might not necessarily, um, might necessarily be that weight. You know, you might just optimally for your body to function at its best, you might just need a bit more weight on you than you think you do. Kellyanne was talking about um, what you put into your body is what you get out of it and the importance of what you eat in terms of what you expect of your body and how much energy you have and that kind of thing um, and that has definitely become hugely important for me and um, it's something that I never really thought about a lot before I started changing up my diet um, and you know I've noticed things like that I won't be as hungry all the time and stuff like that and I think that's an, that's because I have fewer cravings um, but also I think it's because when you think about it when you're hungry your body wants nutrients and this is something that Charlie Says Go talked about a bit as well and um, your body wants nutrients and if you stuff it with just say bread white bread or something like that you're not getting the nutrients that it actually needs so it's just, just going to get hungry again in a few hours whereas if you're eating lots of fresh fruit and fr fresh vegetables and you know protein and nuts and all the things that you actually really need your body isn't going to get as hungry so much it just I do find that, that actually 
that actually tends to work. Uh, and obviously in terms of, of energy and how you feel and how healthy you are. Um, it kind of, it's kind of mind boggling to me now that I was surprised that I was getting sick all the time, that I constantly had a cold or whatever. When I think about what I was actually putting into my body and what I was, ex what I was expecting my body to maintain itself on, it just, you know, it didn't really add up. It was sort of managing to, to get along okay with the small amount of fruit and veg that it would actually was was getting um, but I was sabotaging myself and I wasn't even aware of it and I think it's just that an awful lot of people get away with it a lot or they think they are you know that they they won't get sick all the time they feel like they have enough energy um, so you, you kind of have this this notion perpetuated by society that the way that most people eat in western society and, and I think I mean this is does seem to be worse in America than it is over here in Europe um, but it's sort of, you feel like you just, oh, it's fine, you can get away with it. As long as you eat your five, you know, your five a day um, and you do a bit of exercise and not every piece of bread you eat is white or rather than brown or whatever, you get a bit of fiber into you, then you're fine. You can eat whatever you want apart from that. Um, and while I think it's definitely fine to indulge in something, sometimes I'm definitely like not a Nazi about it. Um, and I definitely think your body can take a certain amount of other things. Like I don't think eating a bit of sugar every now and then is actually just going to poison you or, you know, um, at the same time, the less you eat of that stuff, the more you can eat of the things that are actually really good for you and that are going to nourish you and give you energy. And maybe some people can get away with, you know, less of that good stuff and more of the crap. Maybe they genuinely can. Um, but if you're suffering from, you know, just feeling really tired all the time and just being chronically ill, then I would definitely suggest that you, um, that you try just getting more good stuff into your diet. And as Kellyanne talked about as well, like you, you will actually develop a taste for this stuff. I never would have thought a year ago that I would be munching down raw vegetables and you know, all the kind of foods that I'm eating now and genuinely enjoying it. I really wouldn't have. I would have been like, it needs a sauce. It needs this, that or the other, it, you know, needs something to make it tasty. No, to me now, raw vegetables are actually tasty, um, which is quite a revelation. Um, and I think it's kind of a good sign. If you get to a point where raw fruit and veg is genuinely really tasty and you genuinely enjoy eating it, then I think you're probably at a point where your body is functioning in a more kind of normal way and you're, you're having cravings and appreciating the food that is actually good for you to be eating. So I just want to say a few more words um, about maybe some bad habits that I've had with um, eating and um, maybe some negative patterns and stuff like that. A few things that Kellyanne kind of got me thinking about. Um, so the first and most obvious thing was that she opened her video by suggesting that um, in order to get better control over how much you eat, and particularly in terms of overeating, that you um, switch off when you eat and that you just sit down and eat your meal and don't distract yourself with, you know, 101 other things while you're doing so. And I am 100% guilty of doing that. <laughs> while watching Kellyanne's video, I was sitting there eating my lunch. And to be honest, I just, that's a habit that I've never been able to kick and that I'm just not even really trying that hard to kick because I kind of have it in my head. Oh, it's, it's not doing me any harm. And you know, I don't tend to overeat, so it's fine. Um, but I am aware that I would probably be better off. I would enjoy my food more. I would probably and digest better, I, you know, um, it would give me a, a nice opportunity to maybe inject some spirituality or some, you know, some sacred contemplation into my eating as well, which I just don't do. I'm really bad for that. Um, I grew up in a household where we always ate meals together as a family and we would just chat over dinner. Um, and that's fine, I've no problem doing that and I still really enjoy eating meals with other people but when I'm on my own, uh, which I frequently am while eating, I just have to have something to do at the same time. <laughs> and I'm not too bad when I'm in work, sometimes I go out to the park and I will sit and eat um, just sitting there on my own, that's fine. But when I'm on my own in the flat, I just it's, it's just this compulsion, I have to have something to be doing at the same time and I will frequently be watching a video and playing a game of solitaire on the computer at the same time while eating. It's quite bad, but um, I think maybe that's more to do with spending time alone. Um, despite the fact that I feel like I'm somebody who is really comfortable with spending time on my own and I really enjoy it and I need it, um, I think maybe I have actually developed some mechanisms for avoiding feeling lonely uh, and that kind of thing because um, I moved out first out of my parents' house into an apartment on my own, into this apartment actually. I've been here for several years, for about three years now. Um, 
And yeah, I think maybe I just sort of developed these mechanisms early on to sort of avoid having to just sit on my own in silence. Uh, and whereas these days that wouldn't bother me anymore, maybe it would have bothered me uh, at the time. Um, I do have, I suppose, other tendencies that relate to that. Um, when I'm tired at the end of the day, coming home and, you know, switching on something to watch and needing to do that rather than just finding something else to do that doesn't involve the computer. But I'm sure, I'm sure that's something that's quite common in other people too. But I don't see that as being a habit that I kick anytime soon. But um, I don't know, I, I, might, I might consider trying to do that, trying to actually spend time with my meal and enjoy it more. Um, and finally, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of why you eat the junk food that you eat, why you fall into those patterns of eating badly, um, why people feel that compulsion to, to eat sweet things or, 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 or whatever. Um, I mean, to some extent, it's because we find them addictive. We find chocolate addictive, we find sugar addictive. Um, it's a very kind of fast form of energy that our body can just utilize very, very quickly. It's, it's just very convenient for the body. So it will crave those things if you, if you, give, it to, if you give your body those things, it will continue to crave them. Um, but I do feel like for me anyway, and probably for others, there is um, a very strong emotional um, tendency underlying that as well. And I think about that quite a lot. I mean, I of, often have this idea in my head, well, I could give up a lot of things. I, um, I've given up wheat. Well, I mean, even when I was deciding to give up wheat and things like that, those were difficult things for me to do as well. Um, when I gave up wheat, I, I mean, I, I still do very occasionally have wheat products and, and stuff like that because I don't want to be too rigid about it. But when I was giving up wheat, I was thinking, can I do this? I, is life too short kind of thing? You know, that kind of mentality of, I really enjoy wheat. I really enjoy bread. Um, and I just, I want to be able to enjoy those things. And I, I have the same thing, particularly strongly with chocolate. I always have it in my head, like, oh, I could never give up chocolate. And it would just, it would never be worth it. No matter how good I felt, it would never be worth it. Um, I do have to question that quite a lot and wonder if it really has anything much to do with how good the thing tastes and how good the actual experience of eating the thing is, or if it's more to do with holding on to mechanisms to feel good. Um, that then subsequently we can use to punish ourselves and to feel guilty about. It, I don't know, it, it seems to me that surely I could just decide that I could give up chocolate and pick some other kind of treat that I can give myself um, that isn't bad for me. Um, I can't off the top of my head even think of what kind of treat that might be. Um, but I feel like this relationship with junk food and relationship with sweet things might actually run quite deep. Um, when you think about it, when, you, when you're giving yourself a treat, generally speaking, a treat is something that you don't give yourself that often, that you allow yourself, that it's, it's sort of, it has that sort of forbidden kind of exciting quality, quality to it. It's often that you'll, you'll, you'll eat something or you'll buy something for yourself or um, I can't even off the top of my head I think of anything else. Um, I'm just having, <clears throat> just having a bit of a blank about it, but I was just thinking about that la last night about, how a lot of the time the treats that you allow yourself are things that are bad for you that you would ordinarily kind of think, well, I, I don't want to have those things off and I'll have them as a treat. Um, yeah, and I was kind of wondering, like, what could I actually even give myself that would not be bad for me? Um, are, are there treats that I can really get it into my head, this is a proper treat. Like, I really enjoy meditating, I really enjoy journaling, I really enjoy making art, I really enjoy, there's a lot of things like that that I really enjoy. But I, I feel as though they stop feeling like a treat when they're not bad for you. Once you start considering them to be something that, um, that is sort of conducive to your ego and conducive to who you want to be and, and how productive you want to be and how creative you want to be and that kind of thing. Um, if, it's, if it's being used to build up your self-image and your idea of the kind of perfect person that you want to be, I think doing those things becomes not a treat. Do you see what I mean? Um, I think I've definitely become really guilty of that kind of mentality uh, to the point where I will often just end up not doing those things that I really enjoy doing, um, like painting or just journaling and stuff like that. I won't make the time for it uh, because it's not considered as a treat. It's something that I feel like I should be doing 
you know? I should be painting more because it makes me happy. It, it gets that really kind of convoluted, weird logic um, by it. Whereas something like eating chocolate, that's simple. That's a treat. That's something, it's not gonna take a lot of effort or time. And it's very definitely not advancing me as a human being. It's not adding anything to, to me as a person. Um, and it just becomes much easier to associate that sort of, oh, I can sit down and have some chocolate and that's gonna be nice. That's gonna be a treat. Um, or sit down and watch TV. That's become something like that for me now too because I don't watch an awful lot of TV. So sitting down and watching an episode or something, it's like, yeah, that's a treat. Um, but it's not necessarily something that I enjoy as much as doing something that doesn't involve sitting, staring at a screen, um, like working with tarot or journaling. Now, I suppose in that case, maybe it's something to do with taking less effort, but I feel like there's something there that needs to be worked out in my own mind. And I suspect that a lot of people have a similar kind of connotation with um, eating junk food, it being a treat and not being able to reassign the idea of a treat with things that are actually not bad for you.